it's great to have you all here. I want to start by telling you about um, some of the, the disempowerments from my own family. So my mother was a, a frontline ambulance driver for the Free French Army in the Second World War. She was English, but she wanted, she came from a military family and um, she wanted to have a frontline role. The only way she could have, have a frontline role was by joining the Free French Army. She won two um, medals, the Croix de Guerre, which is the top French military medal twice for rescuing soldiers under fire in the front line. In one of the episodes, an artillery shell went through her ambulance, uh, but because the side of the ambulance was made of canvas, the artillery shell didn't explode. She really saw sort of horrors and she came back from the war with um, what would nowadays be called post-traumatic stress syndrome. And when I and my twin brother were born, um, she didn't really know how to connect with us. She didn't know how to bond with us. And she went back to work within a week of um, uh, us being born. And one of the really sad things about that was that my, um, my twin brother and I um, were sort of competing for this limited resource of love. And so we didn't connect, we didn't connect with each other either. So a lot of the work that I've done in, you know, personal development work, coaching work, psychotherapy has been about, um, you know, healing um, the attachment wound, the childhood wound, the relationship wound, my ability to connect with people that was set up by having a mother who couldn't connect and a, and a father who was um, pretty absent. But I've never really looked at the impact of my ancestors on um, on my own psychology. And um, And my mother married my father because he was the opposite of a bully. He was the opposite of a macho man. But because she was choosing someone opposite to her father, that also had consequences as well. Um, my mother's father and her, his wife were fighting all the time. There was a lot of arguing and fighting. My uncle, my mother's brother, was a, became a bit of a bully. My uncle's daughter, was um, her mother was dying of cancer. And she said to me, you know, when your mother called me down to tell me that my mother had just died, because I didn't come straight away. She shouted, Catherine, buck up, come now. So the frightened little girl went downstairs to see my mother, who then, you know, perhaps in a slightly different tone, but, you know, after that tone said, you know, your mother's just died. Um, and um, there are other sort of terrible stories. My mother's brother was, um, he was learning French and he couldn't remember the word for holly. This is such an awful thing for holly in French, you know, the holly bush. Uh, and so his father took him outside and pushed him in a holly bush, pushed him in and out of a holly bush, shouting the word in French. And I still want to look back beyond that, but that was sort of like that very, very tough military lineage, which um, I've really been unconscious of because, you know, through the sort of, you know, I was, 15 in 1970 that was just the end of the hippie era I was all love and peace I was personal development I wasn't interested in the military side of things so I just ignored it but I ignored a part of my family history that has massive impact on me I noticed it a while ago I was in hospital I was going to have a nasty procedure and the nurse said this is people really you know find it very very difficult to have this procedure do you want to have are you going to have it and out of my words came, mouth came the words, you know, this isn't as, as, this isn't as tough as the Normandy landings. You know, it's a ridiculous thing to say. Um, but so we carry things from our personal history, from our ancestors that we may only be partially aware of. And um, you may be, in fact, um, the week after next, when I'm teaching on collective shadow, I'm gonna talk about something that's massive in my family um, that I was completely unconscious of until recently. So the, the problem is, it's if you're not, if you're aware of it and haven't dealt with it, um, you need to sort of deal with it if, it if it's getting in your way. You need to look at your history. And if you're unaware of it, it may be biting you on the bum. And that's a technical psychological term. It may be biting you on the bum without you even knowing it. You know, so it's like, what are the things that sabotage you in your life? And you don't really know where they come from. So for those of you who haven't done psychological work, 
the first place to look is in your own personal family history. That's the first place to look. You know, what was your relationship with your mother and father? Was that, what, what was that like? And then the second place to look is, well, I've done quite a lot of healing there. Then what, you know, what was being carried through from my ancestors before that? By the way, just pro close proximity to someone who's been traumatized can have a traumatizing effect. That's, the, that's what the research says. You can get traumatized just by being uh, close, emotionally close with someone who was traumatized. And in fact, um, you know, all of you know, I hopefully you know this, that a trauma can be carried down three generations. You know, so I have, I know someone whose parents were kids in Nazi concentration camp. They, you know, they came to Britain. One of them became an engineer, made lots of money, you know, and the other one became a doctor, all looked very successful, but they had real concerns about health. Their daughter has a sort of neurosis around health. And the, um, the granddaughter also has problems with flying and other, other things. Three generations, the, the trauma has been carried down three generations. So first you look at, you know, is, is this wound, is my dysfunctional behavior, is what's not quite optimal in my life, if, is what's her, hurting from my own personal history and my relationship with my family, my own lifetime, my relationship with my parents. Secondly, you look at, you know, could it be carried from ancestors before that? And then thirdly, which we'll look at the week after next, which is collective shadow, which is, is there something in the culture or our society that has influenced how you feel about your, how your ancestors felt about themselves and how you feel about themselves. And then we'll talk about, you know, systemic racism, homophobia, um, um, gender stuff, patriarchy. We'll, we'll just talk about all of that. Um, um, but that's the week after next. But I just want to mention it now because there's another dimension, which is what are the messages coming from a culture? So to simplify, you could say the first port of call is to look at what is the, what are the messages, the empowerments and the disempowerments that you've received in this lifetime. That's the first level. Then this, you know, from the systems in which you've lived. The second level is what are the empowerments and the disempowerments you've received from your ancestors. And then the third level is what, you know, culturally, systemically, what are the empowerments and disempowerments that you've received, for, uh, you, you or your ancestors have received. And so these are all things that, the basic message is, is that if you don't know what it is that's biting you on the bum, you, it's gonna be pretty hard to fix it. Um, so that's the first level. Actually, Next week, Celine Vega, who's a colleague of mine, um, I'm away next week. She's going to say, well, what if, you, if you've got a feeling, but you don't know where it comes from? Or if you were an orphan, you know, you don't know who your parents were. And uh, um, again, um, you know, it, it all fits together. We'll talk about how that works, um, how, how you deal with it in those situations. But the first port of call is, if there's something that's nagging you, find out what it is. Uh, there's a famous book by Ursula Le Guin called The Wizard of Earthsea. And uh, it's a little bit, you know, male oriented. It's young wizard, goes to wizard school. Um, but she writes it in this most beautiful way. It goes to wizard school, uh, borrows one of his teacher's spell books, opens, show, is showing off as an adolescent does to his friends, opens a... Uh, uh, an, a door to the underworld, realizes he's made a mistake, tries to slam it shut, but a shadow has escaped. And then he's chased for hundreds and hundreds of pages by this shadow. And finally, he goes back to the village, the wizard who was his master when he was in the village and says, what shall I do? And the, the master says, you know, you will never escape from the shadow that's pursuing you. So the only thing you can do is to turn around and start to pursue the shadow. And so then there's hundreds and hundreds of pages of him pursuing the shadow. And when he finally, and he's on the ocean in a tiny little um, sailing boat on these enormous waves on a vast ocean, he finally comes across the shadow. 
and he leaps from the boat and he grabs the shadow by the neck. And as he grabs it by the neck, he sees that it has his own face. So that's a sort of metaphor, which is that, you know, if I get um, upset or annoyed or wounded or hurt, and, you know, I can usually just, you know, walk it off or, you know, watch a movie or talk to a friend, or, you know, lots of things we can do. If it follows me for a week, perhaps I should do something about it. If it follows me for a year, you know, what happens if it follows you for a decade or half a lifetime? So at some point you say, actually, the cost of just not doing anything is bigger than the cost of facing it. And, you know, and people who've done psychotherapy and deep personal development work will, will know the benefit of, of looking at that. If you've done that deep work and you haven't got all that you want, it may be the ancestral messages or it may be the, um, you know, collective um, messages from uh, culture or society that you, you're, you, you've been brought up in. Um, oh, someone's just unmuted themselves. I'm gonna mute you, Tony, if you don't mind. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, so that's the topic of this week. Next week is what if you don't know your ancestors or have a feeling, but don't know where it comes from? That's with Celine Vega, hosted by Akin, who's here today. The week after, we're going to look at healing collective shadows. And the 2nd of March, we're going to bring it all together. So it's important to say that this is a psychoeducational talk. It's not psychotherapy. If you need um, trauma work, go to a trauma therapist. I recommend um, somatic experiencing. It's one of the, the recent and most powerful approaches. And I'll talk about the somatic element in a minute. And the, um, the way that people nowadays deal with trauma and you know all of these things but trauma in particular is that you want to feel it in your body but only one sip at a time so the approach that we've um, taken so far in the first session we did we, we looked at what empowers us what are the messages from our ancestors that empower us and what are the messages that disempower us in the second session, we spent the whole of the second session looking at what are the messages from our ancestors that empower us, and in particular, but, but not only our biological ancestors, our biological lineages, but also our teachers, our spiritual lineages, our psychological lineages. You know, for example, Gregory Bates and Milton Erickson, um, um, Ashiba, the founder of um, um, uh, uh, Aikido, um, for me, my Tibetan Buddhist master and his father and the whole lineage going back. I have a very strong sense of the lineage going back. So last week, we looked at all the empowering lineages um, that we have. And so this week, we're looking at the, the disempowering lineages. But the way we do this is we're going to invoke the empowering lineages and then we're going to have the empowering lineages hold the space for us to just taste a, a little of any disempowering lineages or messages that we have. And particularly, you know, so if at one end of the spectrum, you've got something quite mild, you know, you've got, um, you know, you were, you know, middle class and didn't feel very empowered in society or something, you know, it's re relatively mild. Uh, you know, working class or something like that, but you weren't, you, not, nothing terrible, but nothing, not, not great messages. You know, then you can, br you bring all of those resources to bear to transform that. If it's something big, like major trauma, um, then what you do is you bring the resources to it one sip at a time. You just touch it and then you go back to the resources. You touch it and go back to the resources. You touch it and go back to the resources. And actually last week uh, and the week before, we talked about developing inner guardians who only let you taste a little taste of it, who are there making sure that you don't experience too much of it. Um, so, and just some things to say about trauma, which is that, so you know, one of the ways you know you've got trauma is if you disassociate a lot, you disassociate from your feelings a lot. You know, you disconnect in relationships, 
you know, that would be very obvious. Or you daydream a lot, or you watch a lot of TV, um, or you um, eat to suppress feelings. Lots of, you know, there are lots of disorders like eating disorders or alcohol, which are ways of disassociating. You have some way that take, something that takes you away from your physical, emotional, bodily experience. That's, that's a sign you've got trauma. And of course, nowadays, there's a, a different definitions of trauma. In the old days, people used to talk about the one-time learning, you know, the sort of car accident, um, you know, the battlefield trauma, those sorts of things. Um, but actually, um, nowadays, they talk about, you know, um, complex trauma, which is if you were in a very, um, you know, um, you know, psychologically abusive or physically abusive family, lots of little traumatic incidents can all add up to major trauma. It doesn't have to be a single incident. It can be um, chronic and complex over a long period of time. And actually more and more um, psychological difficulties are being treated with these um, somatic methods, which means, you know, talking about it can help, it's good to talk about it to start with, to know what it is, but actually the thing to shift is the feeling and therefore having the psychological resources to bring to the feeling and then just tasting it and coming back out again. And particularly with this ancestral stuff, take it slow. Um, there's something called um, trauma release TRE, tra trauma release exercises, where they do a sort of shaking that's basically body oriented shaking to release trauma. In a two-hour class, they only let you do two minutes of that. You know, it's just like lots of little tastes, then you'll come back to it. The reason why we dissociate is because um, it's too painful. That's why we spend hours on Facebook or YouTube or do dis fant fantasy or distraction activity, or we numb ourselves with alcohol or um, some other drug. Um, you know, or lots of, you know, lots of too much Netflix or whatever it happens to be. Um, we do it to take ourselves away from the feelings. That's the positive intention of the disassociation. But then, you know, you, you're wasting half your life watching Netflix or you're, you can't work because you're, you still got a hangover from yesterday or you've damaged your health or you can't relate because the, the slightest hint of something difficult, you're out of your body and you can't connect emotionally. So the way back in, you know, is to just feel a little bit at a time and then just as enough as feels safe and then to, um, to go back to a safe place and then just taste a little bit more and go back to a safe place. And if you've got, um, you know, serious trauma, then go and see a trauma therapist. You know, that's the way. And, the, you know, the um, somatic experiencing is, is the sort of the new version based on the work, work of Peter Levine and other people. Um, it's really helpful. It's just very body orientated. If you think about it, if something, if there's a feeling in your body that really hurts a lot, talking about it will only touch it to some extent. So you may need to tell the story. You know, if something happened and you've never told the story, then it's great to tell a therapist the story or tell a friend a story. And sometimes that can be enough. You know, I, you know, sometimes you have someone who had something that they're really ashamed of that happened to them when they were a teenager. And like, you know, for example, mild, you know, mild, you can't really call it mild, but sexual abuse that's not, you know, mild sexual abuse. And then, um, you know, and just to talk about it and just it, with someone who doesn't have any shame, you know, doesn't support them in the shame can have a massive, you know, create a massive shift. Just talking about it can make a shift. But if it's really physically in your body, then that's where you need to deal with it. The talk, once you've talked about it a couple of times, you talking about it more doesn't really help. But of course, in the talking therapy, the empathic connection between you and the therapist, that can be healing of itself. So it's not to say that talking therapies are not the answer, but that because if you've got a feeling of empathic connection, between you and the therapist or the coach or the friend, and you're bringing that empathic connection to yourself, then you can feel into it a little bit and, and then come step back out and feel in a bit more and step back out. But the talking part isn't the bit that 
after the initial reveal of what the story is, isn't necessarily the, the, the most healing thing. Um, any questions before we go into a meditation on this subject? Any questions? Great, Marina, go on. <clears throat> yeah, um, I don't know if I've formulated it right. You know the thing when you start digging into your ancestors, <clears throat> there's something for me about, there's certain things I do know, and I know I can feel it in my body, yeah. but there's other things perhaps I probably don't know because I haven't done the digging around. And I'm yeah. just, you know, it's that thing about, do you do the digging around or do you just kind of stick with, you know, when you get that feeling or you know, what you were saying about that part, there's something about, you know, the thing about if it keeps following you around, do you, you've got to get into it. I'm just wondering whether to it go... It, it, it just depends. It could be, I mean, there are a number of different approaches. One could be, there's something biting me on the bum. I don't know what it is. I've done a lot of therapy. Maybe I need to look at my ancestors. You know, I've talked to a therapist about it. So, that, you know, that's one approach. And another approach is that, you know, you've done a lot of work on yourself and <clears throat> you're just curious about... <clears throat> very unconscious influences you sort of you know there are certain things that you do and you wonder why and you can't, it doesn't quite connect to the way you were brought up um it, you know and then you know so then you want you know so then you say well actually maybe i will do some digging around i've just been on ancestry creating looking at my family tree and i've been writing to relatives and collecting stories it's like what are the different cultural what are the vibes the the combination of empowering and disempowering messages that i get from each of my lineages uh, and you and if you've got it's complicated if you're a sort of from just your all your parents and your grandparents are all from the same people and the same piece of land you know then then you may have a reasonably syst systematic message but for example i have got um uh you know upper class Germans and um, uh, um, um, Jewish Germans, uh, are my grandparent, my great grandparents on one side. Now, if you look at that that combination, that's a difficult combination. They came, fortunately, they came to Britain in the twenties. Oh. You know, so if you've got if you've got one side that's really empowered, and you know, I've got upper class and another place, I've got upper class British, all those empowerment messages, and I've got sort of lower sort of lower middle class working class Irish you're gonna I'm gonna get two different sets of messages aren't I mm -hmm. and so then it all gets quite confused and so I think sort of some untangling is quite helpful you sort of notice how come I've got this in me where did this come from um I noticed with you know I mean I don't want to get into a talk I, I don't want to talk about it you know the the anti-vax thing <laughs> but but i noticed that some of the, the, the one of the things that's come up recently which is how much do you trust your government how much do you trust science if you come from a country where that lying was the major thing that the governments did you're much more likely to think that that's the case if you come from a country where mostly they told the truth and then sometimes they lied you will have that attitude. You know, we can see how we carry those stories, not through down through the generations. Um, so that's what this is about. Thank you, Marina. Any other questions before we do the meditation? I don't know where to begin the story, really. Um, but unlike you, with many named people and even with histories, I don't know um much about my ancestors and uh there's there's a, a sort of situation in the past which i've tried talking to therapists about and <laughs> i remember the man at the tavistock said you're too sick for treatment i think he didn't believe the story i was telling him uh so at that point i thought well what you know, do I, I do? Book, I'd put that on the back cover of the therapist. The therapists yeah. are not going to listen to me. Yeah. Where do I go? I mean, I spend all my time writing. 
and obviously I'm, I'm working from this unknown source. Um, and I've tried the ancestry route as well, and I'm, I'm waiting to re-motivate myself with that. But I, I, Next I, week, the session on, you see, what, you see, okay, so that this gives us an opening to it. So I notice that I feel certain things, and when I apply my psychological tool in my body, when I apply my psychological tools, I don't really know where they come from. You know, so that is really interesting. If you've done a bit of psychological work and you've got feelings and you don't know where they come from, you know, then you get really curious. Wow. You know, it's not you know, sometimes I go inside, you know, I long for love. Oh, I need to call a friend. You know, I can sort of, or oh, I'm angry. So I'm not very good at expressing anger, but who do I need to speak to? You know, there's sort of the normal psychological things that one would do if one had done some workshops or courses or things. But then sometimes if there's a feeling, you say, I don't know where this comes from. I've got this feeling. It keeps coming back. It's quite strong. I don't know where it's come from. So, I mean, just to mention two options. One option is that it could be, you know, first three years of life before you talked. So it could, and it could even be womb stuff. And then the second is it could be ancestral. And the third is it could be something from the culture, you know, from, you know, how your community was treated by the world. Mm -hmm. um, so then you start, but so if you can't get the information, you know, for example, if you're an orphan, um, you know, if you're, you know, you were adopted, then you just work directly with the feeling. And that's where, I don't know where the TAVI is now, but in, you know, TAVI used to be quite classical psychoanalytic tools, very, very good at the talking stuff. I'm sure they're good at the, the body orientated stuff, but I don't have any evidence for that now. Mm -hmm. And, and there are body orientated therapists which have come up in the last 10 years. I, I, I am working with a, what did she call it? A somatic uh, expression or something. Experiencing. She really, it, it is really good. Yeah. That's what I'm recommending. Great. Yeah. yeah. So that's, so that's, in fact, and that's the topic of next week, which is working directly with the feeling rather than just mm. bypassing the story. It's a lot quicker. Yeah. You know, so, um, and just everybody, it's great to, we need to tell our stories, but once you've told them, th you know, three times, then you probably, you, at what point does it become a scratched record? You're just spending a lot of money telling the same story in therapy. So once you've told the story a few times, you just say, I'm not getting so much mileage from this. Go direct to the body. Mm. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. Any, great. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? before we do the meditation. Or any other concerns? Great, let's do the meditation and go on Georgina, Georgian. I've hurt my legs, so I have to lie down for the meditation. Great, okay. I'd like to turn my camera off maybe. Okay. Yeah, sometimes people turn their camera off for the meditation, but yeah, it's great okay. if you turn it on again afterwards. Yeah, I, I, I will. It's just... Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, where have you gone? Uh, Mandy. You have yeah, to unmute. I just wanted to put a word in for the arts therapies, particularly dance and dance psychotherapy and music therapy and drama therapy, because they all work somatically as well. Um, with trauma, sometimes through metaphor and body. So there's like a, a further distant step. So I just wanted to put a word in for those two. Thank you. <laughs> okay, let's do the meditation. Um, so I'm just, as you know, centering myself. And for those of you who are new to this work, why do we do meditations? The answer is that if it's in the body, you're not gonna sort it out with just your head. And so therefore you need to engage the body. If we're, you know, if soulfulness is body, emotion, mind, and spirit, um, we've all been educated, we've had so much education on mind, but um, we haven't had much education on body somatics, our emotional selves, our gut 
the gut brain, the heart brain, and we haven't had much education on spirit. So meditations are helpful because the, the barriers, if you like, between mind, emotion, and body, and spirit become more permeable. There's more communication, more um, between all those different levels of ourselves, and therefore we're more likely to touch the places in ourselves that need to be touched with uh, healing energy. And so the, the way to do that is, to, is mindfulness. Well, one of the ways to do this is mindfulness which is you could imagine a time when you were really connected into a deep state with yourself and see, hear, and feel that. And that's a great way to do it. As many of you know, the way that I do it is just by paying attention to the senses. And so as I sit here, I'm just aware of what I see, what I hear, what I feel. I'm just bringing myself to all of those experiences. And then just to use the format from Betty Erickson, I notice four things I see, whether my eyes are open or closed. Of course, if your eyes are closed, you've got the, sh the darkness of your eyelids and you've got the little specks of light on your eyelids. And you've also got the images in your mind's eye. And then I listen to four things that I hear. And actually I personally, listen to five things. I listen outside the window. Can I hear anything outside the house? I listen for any sounds in the house. I listen to the sounds in the room. For example, the echo of my voice or you you can hear my voice from your computer. I listen for sounds in my body. My breathing. If it's quiet enough, my heart. And then I listen to, to discover if there's any internal dialogue, if I'm talking to myself. And I listen from a distance, just curious. What is he talking about? What is that about? Like listening to someone at a party or at a networking meeting. Curious, interested, but you don't necessarily believe it. And it is important to listen from a distance because it's so easy to believe it's your voice when actually it's just one of the voices, one of the channels in your brain. And actually, given that you're someone who can hear the sounds in the street, the sounds in the house, the sounds in your body, who can feel all these things in your body. You're so much more than just that voice in your head. And then I pay attention to four things. Four feelings. Four things I feel somewhere on my skin, perhaps air temperature, perhaps pressure of clothing, or the floor against the sole of the foot. 
a muscle in my body, maybe a muscle that I haven't paid attention to recently. To feel the muscular system and to pick a place to feel. And an emotion, paying attention to an emotion in the trunk of my body. And one more thing that you feel. And three things you see, whether it's with your eyes closed or open. If your eyes are open, there's a really nice thing to do, which is to focus on a single point somewhere in, the, in front of you. Soften your gaze so that you can see with your peripheral vision, so that you can see three different things without moving your eyes, by keeping your eyes on a single point. Three things that you hear. Three different things that you feel. Two things that you see. Two things that you hear. Two things that you feel. One thing that you see. One thing that you hear. One thing that you feel. Really good to focus on our breathing because there's so much information in a breath, so much going on. To feel the coolness of the air in your nose, how your chest expands as you breathe in, and the pause before you breathe out. Before we 
look at anything to do with disempowerment or wounding or difficulty or mild trauma, let's ensure that we have the resources we need, the support we need. So as you think of what you need to face difficulty in yourself or your history, who is really a powerful resource? Or what? Is it a spiritual figure? Or some archetypal form? or something to do with Mother Earth, nature. Or a great teacher. Or someone you know just loves you to pieces. And it may be one figure or person or several may appear. Just allow them to appear. And what's really helpful is to make sure that you can see them, you can hear what their words, you can feel how it feels. And another thing that's often really helpful is to bring them close, perhaps even into the room. So they're close with you rather than distant figures. And so you can just really just enjoy feeling their energy. Perhaps hearing soothing words. And sometimes there are, the, you know, the big, I shouldn't say the big guns really, but you know what I mean, the big figures. But actually, I can imagine a circle of the, my, my friends who love me. There's enough of them that I can't really believe the stories about me being unlovable when I feel the people in my life right now. Or the people whose hearts I've touched with my heart. And there may be some unexpected characters, a pet, for example. My tortoiseshell cat from childhood. We used to sleep in each of the children's beds on alternate nights. Is here with me. or a big tree, or a time where you were by the ocean and felt connected to all of life. Or a character from a storybook book, Pippi Longstocking. Or Lord of the Rings.
and just say, I'm someone who can love and I can do good in the world. I want to do good in the world. I ask for all the support and healing and powerful energy to transform my suffering, my difficulties, so that I can just be more present in the world and have a more open heart. Make a prayer like that. I think all of us can sense that the more healed we are, the more generous we can be in a, in a healthy way. So we're asking the universe to support us. Secondly, I want to ask in a particular group of protectors who we might call the guardians. Their job is to let us feel, begin to process what we need to process, but not too much. They're like the sort of bodyguards. They'll let you feel some of the difficulty a little, but not too much. They're observers of the process, they're watching. They don't want you to get overwhelmed. They want you to, to go in enough to get a little taste and bring the resources in, bring the quality of love or support in that's needed, but not to full, not to not to re-traumatize yourself. It's a balance. It's a balance. I'm thinking of, you know, making a cocktail. You want to get the proportions right. A lot of tomato juice and just a little vodka. I don't know. You want a lot of positive energy to process a small amount of wounding. That's what you need. That's the right proportion. And the bodyguards are there to make sure that that happens. And if at any point you need to dissociate, just step out of your body, feel free to do that or step back. Better not to step out if possible, but to step back to your resources. But stepping out is always an option. It's always good to know. Most of us, have, many of us have done it a large part of our lives, so there's no need to stop now. But the idea is to find a place where we can feel the quality of these supporters, of these protectors, of these people who love us, these healing forces, these great healers, to feel that and just to take little sips of the difficult experience in the context of something much, much bigger. I'm not the trauma, it's only a little part of my experience. I'm not the wounded person, it's only a little part of my experience. I'm much, much more. It can be really great to notice consciousness itself. I see, I hear, I feel there's something mysterious here. I'm alive. And in my aliveness, there are many things. My appreciation of nature, my really good friends, being kind to people. my enjoyment of my favorite drink. My breathing. And in my aliveness, there is also difficulty. Or there's stuff in my body that needs healing. But to really stay connected with the bigger resources as we just taste touch into 
you can touch into a bit of a feeling and then back away, go back to the resources. One way to do it might be that you are standing really close with one of the resources and perhaps you hold their hand. And then while holding their hand, you step out closer to the difficulty in you. Maybe just touch the difficulty with your toe or with your other hand. And if it's too much, you just go back close to the resource. But you do a sort of dancing movement between the resources that support you. There's a female Buddha in Tibetan Buddhism. I can hug her and I can then step towards the difficulty and just feel a little bit of that and then I can go back and hug her. And whatever your tradition, all the great saints are up for hugs. And all the great beings are up for hugs. It's just that people don't ask. So you keep that connection of the resources. And so now we have the resources and the guardians. And you can just wonder where in my ancestral history, what might be affecting me? Where might I be stuck? What's having too much of an influence down the centuries? Not even the centuries. It could be Europe in the last hundred years, North America in the last hundred years. So much. Decolonization of Africa and Asia. So much. So much change. So you may not have to go back that far. Where's the place that needs a little softening? A little, yes, something terrible happened. And I want to bring healing to that. And what happened then isn't my life now. There's a story of the San Francisco Zoo when they got a, a, a lion. They kept the lion in quite a small cage where it could pace up and down, only 12 paces one way and 12 paces the other way, while they constructed a park around the cage. When they finally let the lion out of the cage, took the cage away in this very nice, beautiful part, the lion still kept taking 12 paces this way and 12 paces that way. So the world has changed, but are we still controlled by the beliefs that came from those times? Can we bring healing and say to the ancestor, it was terrible for you, but I want to lead my life now. Perhaps there's a dialogue with an ancestor. And you say, thank you so much for getting me to where I am. And your life was so hard. Life is easier for me. The world I live in is a different world. A world of 
the 1920s was different to the world of the 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s. 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000, 2010, 2020. What was, say to the ancestors, that was so true for you and you had such an important message but it isn't so true about this world now. Let me learn from you but not act in the way that you needed to act at that time. And what we had to do was disassociation. Maybe the best choice we made. There's a Christian mystic called James Finley. And he said that in his childhood, his father beat him by day and beat his mother by night. And he asked his mother what to do. And his mother was a Catholic and said, pray to God that God will make you safe. And he prayed to God. And he, God gave him a safe place where even when his father was beating him, it wouldn't hurt him anymore. And when he grew up and became a clinical psychologist, he realized that he disassociated. But who is to say that the disassociation wasn't a gift from God? So whatever your compensation was, was the best that you could do. But now perhaps we can just drop by drop feel the pain till we can get that place back in our bodies which was too painful to feel in the past. And perhaps we need support in that. Perhaps we need practitioners, whether it's dance movement therapy, somatic experiencing, creative mind, many modalities of support. Perhaps we need support in that. Perhaps we have enough to just taste a drop, back away, taste a drop, back away. The key is to keep ourselves safe all the time, but not so safe that we're stuck. It's like I'm hugging the female Buddha, but I can put one step in the difficulty, one foot in the difficulty and feel it a little and come back. To go into it, to be safe going into me means you know that you can come back out again. It's just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. When a soldier is on the battlefield and they see their friend, friend's head blown off, best not to cry. The battlefield is not the place to cry. But when you come off the battlefield and you're safe, then that's a good time to cry. But sometimes we forget that we've, we've forgotten that we're not on the battlefield anymore. We can have safety systems, support systems that can let us melt, let us melt the tight muscles. And perhaps we need to go towards systems where we can, systems of people, towards people and circles of people, communities, sanghas, tribes, who can hear, who can hold us and hear us while we feel into it. Sometimes people need such tight holding that one-to-one -one therapy is the best way. Sometimes people need holding by a community and then tribes that are working in some way with emotional holding. 
are are the best way. It's really great to have a community where I can talk about what's great about me, my vision, my resources, my strengths, where I can talk about my woundedness, my vulnerability, my tightness, my defences, where I can show it all and have it witnessed. People who say, yes, when you're showing your greatness and yes, when you're showing your difficulty. Being able to share in a really safe environment is one way to begin the process of healing. Just to say, here I am, this hurts. Here I am, I've been frightened of this. Here I am, I now have the resources to begin to touch this. To be honest, not to say that you've healed it, but to say I'm in the process. Some things may take a lifetime. But if we can hold ourselves with love, that's the key. So we're going to begin to reorientate back to the group. And we're going to just share what we got from the meditation in small groups, but staying deeply connected with ourselves. One person talks for, well, for seven minutes in the group of four. All the others do is listen and say yes and empathize and connect and be there. No advice, not telling them that it's okay not telling people it's safe, just saying, I hear your story, I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. You're only talking about yourself and your own experience in the exercise. Just talk about yourself for that time. Welcome back. Did you get to talk about Chinese ancestors at all? Yes, a lot. 400 years ago. <laughs> 400 years? Yeah. I had a conversation with my ancestor. He from South to from East to Beijing and then sent to Japan as ambassador. So that is the gene our family travel around. Mm. And also I look forward to future 400 years. I talk with my future great, great daughter. Uh, daughter. <laughs> what about, did you talk about the trauma of the 20th century? Oh, yeah. Mm. Like hard time in 1990, 1990s. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome back, everybody. Great to have you here. Um, so, um, what questions? You know, how was it for you? What was it like for you? Do you have any questions? Were you touched by what you heard? Have you had any insights? What would you like to share? And we can sit quietly as well. Um, George, Anna, yeah, um, keep it brief. You're often the first one, so do. I know. Yes, I was just, just, I was just, just say, I was very struck by your story about the lion, and the pacing. Even when they had the space, they got so used to that. Yeah, that's yeah. That's I mean, that trauma does that to us. Yeah, we end up with beliefs about the world, and yeah. then we make those you know beliefs happen. We go around thinking that we're going to be attacked. And then people feel aggressive toward us because we're carrying that attitude, you know. You know, we think we're going to be ripped off, and then we 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 don't take care of ourselves, you know. It's sort of we cr we create self fulfilling prophecies based on our history. Um, thank you, Georgia. Yeah, what else? But uh, Julian, that's a, a not a conscious stance. That's right. It's unconscious. Yeah, and I I don't know if that applies to me, uh, but it might well because on one occasion I didn't mention this when I was in my late teens, an older girl, where I was working, said to me, "Oh, you're the sort of boy who, who always get hurt by women." 
And are you the sort of boy who always gets hurt by women? Well, I actually was there after, and, and I had t- two or three heartbreaks with, with girlfriends, and then I hardened my heart to some extent. Yeah. I mean, exactly. I mean, that's what, what happens. You know, it's sort of like, you know, you, you know, you know, there are some women who say all men are bastards, and there are some men who say all women are this. And you say, well, what, who do all these men have in common? You know, who do all those... You know, it's like if you've got a story that repeats, you're the person that has in common between all the different parts of the story. So then you say, somehow, actually, I once had a therapist who said to me, um, my parents were alcoholics. I was quite young at the time. And he said, um, OK, the next party you go to, look around the room, check out who's the most attractive woman in the room for you. Go and talk to her. And then after about 10 minutes, when you've created a bit of connection, just ask her, Tell me something. Are your parents alcohol- alcoholic? <laughs> and so I did. This woman went, how, how do you know? I said, because I find you attractive. You know, it's sort of one of those, it was like such a clever thing that therapist got me to do. I, I ought to qualify just to say that um, I don't, I'm not blaming any of the women involved. It was circumstantial, uh, probably, uh, but uh, it was deep for me. Uh, and um, there we are. I know as well. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, actually, the point is, is that why are we tra- attracted to certain sorts of people? I mean, that will come from our parents. That's more of a parental thing. Um, but it could also come from the ancestors, you know, because it, there's something that gets passed down the line, you know. Um, you know, for example, my, fa- my mother did the opposite. You know, her brother was a bully. Her father was a bully. Probably her grandfather was a bully. Um, and she went and chose, she picked a wimp. She married a wimp. So she did the opposite. But sometimes people either attracted to the same because it's what they're familiar with, or they get attracted to the opposite. What else? Yeah, and it's a touching story, Paul. Thanks for telling, sharing that with us. It's touching. Um, uh, Mandy. Yeah, just to say um, how incredibly moving it was to share those insights and those stories with, with the two people I was with, and how two of us, you know, bore out your theory. Um, two of us had done a lot of therapy and, you know, told the story many times, and and yet it's still it's still in our bodies. Yeah, yeah. It is so. moving. I think. I mean, sometimes I, I mean I don't want to say that we we shouldn't share it quite a bit because I think if I could tell my my the most difficult things for me you know, the easier it gets, the more healing I've done. You know, it's sort of like being able to say to the friends, this is what happened to me, and not to feel shame about it, Um, not to say it means something about me. You know, that's, you know, to be able to, that's a really helpful, useful, powerful thing. Then you know, you're empowered. You're no longer a victim of it, are you? You're empowered by it. I relate to that. I mean, you know, thinking of my journey, um, and my mother being horrible to me, I won't go into details, but but that it was all my fault, you know, and years and years and years, decades later, I can now say I had a mother who was who was emotionally and physically abusive to me. Yeah. That's yeah, that's that and that's quite a journey. I think that's an example of yeah. That's a really important journey, you know, and because and sometimes, you know, using the sort of the really the standard model that you know I use, you know, sort of why is that up my warm, tender heart? Let's and resources. Let's bring that to the child that we were, and then you have to very often explain to the child: you, it, it's not that you weren't lovable; it was that they were messed up. You know, it wasn't that you didn't deserve attention; it was that they were just screwed up and they were having a hard time in their lives. And we need to change it not just at the adult level in ourselves, but at the feeling level in ourselves, the emotional level. That, that's the harder bit, you know, is to change it at the emotional level great thank you mandy for sharing that that's great any examples of ancestral things from before your parents that you're carrying you know disempowering things from before your parents that you're carrying Stephanie. yeah go on who was that marina just, sorry i just want to pick up finish off where mandy was because i was in mandy's group a question i had and i did pose it well, so you've done all this work, you know what it's about, you've done the re-imprinting, you've da 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 
but it's still somewhere or it could be in the muscle or in the body somewhere that's why it's somatic experiencing and those types of body really but where they really avoid talking about it so much you know where because you can spend a lot of you know you spend an hour on a session you can spend you know an hour talking as you know you can spend a lot of time telling the story um it's really just like let's actually just feel the feeling with resources and let me come back next week and feel more of it and slowly the feeling begins to change or you know i do something called awareness practice where we we do mindfulness awareness and we get a big space using mindfulness and then we hold the feeling in that mindful space and that's all we do hold the feeling in the mindful space um yeah uh, stephanie did you have something to share from previous ancestors i saw your head nodding i may be wrong you're on right mute you're muted yeah no i'm unmuted yeah I, I i definitely have to there is a disconnect there is not much talked about um i i, I know who my I, I can't really go back very much but i definitely have the feeling that there has been something uh, in the last, uh, you know, my my grandparents and, and their parents, you know, there, there has been a disconnect. I, I know it, I know it energetically, but uh, it's, uh, I think that will come up next. I, I, I can't get the story. Yeah. And uh, uh, that's definitely there. And, uh, and it's really also, it's transgenerational. It's also cultural. Uh, yeah. And. Uh, cultural in what way? Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm born in the late 50s. I grew up in, in Germany, in Bavaria, and I didn't have what Stephen Gilligan calls the second skin. Mm. I was exposed. Uh, I grew up in a um, family business, which is uh, hospitality, uh, Bavarian brewery. So, you know, every body fun, but I didn't have, I was exposed to so many things directly. I still know, you know, this old man who had been through the First World War, mm. you know, and, and were uh, coming in and, and, and I, 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 um, I absorbed a lot of vicarious trauma. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because absolutely. nobody was talking, but I was feeling it. Yeah. And, um, and one, uh, thank you very much for That's your... That's really helpful for you to say that. I think it's actually a really helpful thing. We often talk about you know, we often talk about the Nazis, but we don't talk about the trauma that was carried in Germany after the war that couldn't be talked about because of the shame, you know. So that's such an important thing. You know, it's really important to voice that. It's really it was, important. yeah, it was very interesting for me also to watch uh, the Wende when East Germany opened up mm. and how that all went, because there I was, of course, older and I could sort of see how how, how coming out from under such a, dictatorship how, how that is and how that goes so um uh, but i want to share i uh, thank you for your meditation and i want to share when i laid out my my difficult family field as i was talking um and then my time was up but as i was talking the resources came in right and you know and i was i really you know, whenever I go back, I feel the community who saw me grow up, they, they're really supportive of me. I, they must have seen me. They must have also sort of understand, you know, what position I was in and why I left. Right. And they really give me that back, non not speaking about it explicitly, but in how they relate with me. Yeah. Right. And so uh, that came up and that was very nice in the group to experience that. Right, beautiful. I'd like to ask everybody to unmute and then just say a word about how you're feeling right now. Hugged. Wonderful. Connected. Also connected. Also connected. Yes, connected too, yes. yes. Held. Yeah. Held. Connect connected. Over. Doing. Inspired. Yeah. Lovely to have you here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Thank you. Celine is great. Thanks, Julian. So come to Celine next week. That will yeah. be really great. She's Thank you. very, very wise. And I'll Thank see you the you. week after. Yeah.
Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.